you see the opening, take advantage of the opening. Don't sit there and pre-think, hey, I'm gonna do this move beforehand. Hey there, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 324. Today, I'm joined by a student of a multi-time past guest, instructor, school owner of his own right, Laoshi Rod Hoos. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I'm the host for Martial Arts Radio. I've got the best job in the world. I get to talk about martial arts and work on martial arts and train in martial arts and call it my job. Man. I am blessed, and so much of that blessedness is thanks to the support of all of you listening. I truly appreciate the messages, the tags, the purchases that you make of our products. It all really goes a long way. It means so much to me. So thank you for doing that. Check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. We don't send it out very often, once or twice a month maybe. And really just kind of give you an idea of what's happening behind the scenes, throw you a discount once in a while, tell you about new projects we've got going on, maybe give you some behind the scenes on something to do with an episode. You know, we we keep it light. We keep it kind of fast to read through. You know, we're not sending you a book. We're definitely not going to spam you. We're definitely not going to give your address out to anybody or sell it or anything crazy like that. We just want another way of getting in touch with you. That's all. My guest today. Laoshi Rod Hoos is a really thoughtful man, clearly a passionate martial artist, someone who really, it seems, his life was transformed. Maybe not transformed, but at least formed by martial arts. And now he's sharing all of that with his students, and he's here today to share all of that with you. So let me step back and welcome him to the show. Laoshi Hoos, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for having me. Um, I, I appreciate this opportunity yeah. to be given. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm sure we're going to get into it. You you have connection to a past guest, actually a multi-time past guest. Listeners who have been around for a while are racking their brains saying, wait, there are only a few people who have been on more than once. And they're probably trying to guess who that would be. And your title, of course, is a clue. But rather than give away all the all that stuff, now we'll we'll let them sit. We'll let them wonder who it is that you're tied in with. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I like, I like leaving the audience in suspense. You know, it, it's, we don't have commercial breaks on the show. And if we did, you better believe I would, I would leave the, the juiciest stuff till on the other side of the commercial break. I don't, I, I don't know how old you are, but you know, I'm, I'm knocking on 40 and that was a big thing that prior to DVRs and binge shows, Man, they would they would do that all the time on TV, or even do you remember two part TV shows? Actually, yes. Um, <gasps> I've watched I've watched series where like they'll just they'll kind of cut it off where you're like, oh man, I I really want to know what's going to happen next, and you got to wait for like six months to even see yeah. the next part of it. Yeah, one of my least favorite things was. You know, you're watching an hour long drama and there's five minutes left in the show and there's no way they're going to wrap up this predicament that everybody's in in five minutes. So, you know, it's going to a two parter. Then you got to wait another week or, you know, depending on how it falls, you know, maybe right. months. Uh, there, there's a bit of an, uh, uh, synergy with martial arts there, isn't that? So There is. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, this is a a martial arts show. This is not you know, TV talk or, or, or something. I'm sure there are plenty of shows out there where listeners could talk about movies and, and TV. So let's talk about martial arts and let's talk about how you started in martial arts. So take us back. What was that first martial arts class for you? So basically, um, when I started in martial arts, uh, I had a, I had a couple friends bring me into it and, and they told me to come check it out because I, I was actually, I did like maybe one or two classes that they were in for a karate class. And then they transferred over to uh, the Kung Fu class that we're now um, all part of. And uh, I went to, to this class and 
I was watching what they had to offer. Um, a lot of the forums or the katas were, uh, at the time, were very karate like. Um, we have now uh, had them changed, so you're getting more of of a kung fu aspect with more of the animals are kind of coming out in them um, to kind of introduce you a little bit to some of the animal styles. Um, but at the time, uh, I was I was sitting and watching. Uh, I, I looked at the sparring and I liked the sparring for the fact that I seen that they were doing full contact, uh, which a lot of schools around this area don't really do. Um, so I was intrigued by that. Uh, thing, thing about this is when I first got into it, had no fighting experience whatsoever. Um, so I really didn't know what I was doing. So when I first got into it and they started introducing me to kicks and stuff, I felt like I was kind of like more of the outcast in class. Cause I was still warming up to things. And, um, at the time, I don't really think there was anybody, my level, everybody was upper level. Um, so they already knew what they were doing. Um, my, my one Sifu who we now have a tournament for and who passed away here um, a few years back. He, uh, he would notice this and he, he took me aside and he was like, okay, Rod, I want to, uh, I want to go over some Aikido with you. And I go, Aikido, I go, that's interesting. I never have done Aikido or I've never really heard of it. So he was showing me a lock and um we always like to have fun with things we you know we say when you're in martial arts you should have fun with it and if it ever becomes uh, not fun then maybe you should rethink what you're doing um i've enjoyed this ever since i've been in it but at the time he was like telling me he goes well does does this feel like it would be effective and he had me in a wrist manipulation i go I mean, right now, I said, no, not really. And then he actually did the twisting motion to it. And I was flying in the air and I was like, okay, I see the effectiveness in it now. Um, we, got a, we got a good kick out of it. And ever since then, I've, I fell in love with um, martial arts. And ever since then, uh, me and uh, my Sifu, we we would sit there and we would do demonstrations and stuff. And while we were doing demonstrations, he would, uh, he would always, he'd always like whisper in my ear and he'd be like, okay, are you ready? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Am I ready? And he's like, he's like, come do this move. And sometimes we would play with things where we would over exaggerate things so we could have fun with people and stuff. Um, I didn't realize that's what he was trying to get at. And uh, he did this Aikido move and he really did it. And I flew in the air and it looked like I was over dramatizing it, but I wasn't. He actually <laughs> went off and did it. And like, um, but like things like that. And then outside of class, like that, that was the big thing that got me is that we're like a family oriented school so like when you when you join our our school and that's the thing i love about about the school here right now is everybody is so welcoming uh you you can go into a class and the first thing that's going to happen is you're probably going to have one of my students come up shake your hand introduce themselves uh tell you hey if you have any questions or anything you know let myself know or um whatnot and sometimes they they get to the punch before i can even get to it so um so i i like how we're so um family oriented and like my sifu and me we would talk you know on the phone uh on like almost like a daily basis and stuff and uh you know, we would talk about martial arts, but we'd also talk about life, how things are going. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just about the art. It was about 
you know, the interaction, um, it was about, it was about knowing that, that everything was okay with each other. Um, and just making sure that, you know, life was, life was good on both ends. So, so that was another thing that, uh, that drew me into, to our school is that, is that we had that link and, um, we had, we had that togetherness yeah. with each other and it turned into like a family oriented thing. And that's kind of why, um, our school is, uh, a smaller, uh, school is because normally when you come into it, um, here in Grand Forks, a lot of places are more competition oriented where, um, when you come into our school, it's, you get this more family vibe and, and we're more real life based, uh, with our training. So, you know, if you're outside, something happens, you get into this predicament and you have to do something, you're going to know that, Hey, I can do this or that. And you're going to be able to defend yourself at that point. Um, so, so that's something, that's another thing I really liked about school too, because back when I was, uh, back when I was in grade school and stuff, because I didn't know how to defend myself, I, you know, I'd have people picking on me and stuff like that. So it got to the point where I was like, you know, I need to, I need to learn something that's going to teach me how to be able to deal with some of this stuff. So I, so I don't have to go through all my life, you know, having people pushing me around. So knowing that as I was progressing in the, in the school, that I was also getting better. Um, was was a was something I was grateful for and and like that was one thing too with me and um my Sifu he, he would always like you know tell me things I needed to work on but then he'd say you're doing really good at this and that and and I was always so hard on myself thinking okay now you're just trying to be nice to me because I really don't think I'm doing that great at this or that um till i got to like my blue belt which is a high rank in our school um then i started going oh, okay i i see what he was seeing now and i guess i just i wasn't really i wasn't really seeing where he was coming from at that point in time um she, and the thing was is he was a really great um, instructor. He was really good at Aikido. He was good at, uh, the fighting part of the art. So, I mean, he, he knew what he was talking about. Um, for me, I just, I'm, I've always been harder on myself to just keep improving myself. Um, and, and the thing is, is that we have, we have about 12, 12 or 13, I, I can't recall just right offhand, uh, instructors now. Um, we just had a tournament and, um, I had one of my, my advanced students actually, uh, test for black belt and she just became a black belt here at the tournament after the test. And it's kind of funny because all of the black belts in our school um, up until this point have all been males. So she's been the very first female to get a black belt in our, in our school. Nice. I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about this family piece. Cause this is, this so far has been the common thread in everything you're talking about is this family mm -hmm. connection. You're talking about a smaller, a more intimate school. You're talking about a grouping of other schools of, of 
of instructors. You're talking about the way you felt as a kid talking with your Sifu, like you said, almost every day. And that's mm-hmm. something that, excuse me, a, a lot of the folks listening are either going to completely understand or have no idea. It's something that I see is, is nearly binary. It either exists very deeply or it doesn't exist at all when I visit schools. Is that something that you were, let, let's start here. Is that something that you were kind of missing? in your life? I guess I'll ask a deeply personal question. Did you have a strong family life or was that something that you saw in your training that you were missing? You know, in all honesty, I, I grew up in a, in a small family. Um, I had my mother, my father, um, my brother, my sister, um, who in my grandmother, uh, who were all, strong uh they were all strong family figures in my life uh but um beyond them i mean i had friends i didn't i didn't really have a a huge family bond but then i came to this school and I guess I guess a good way to kind of put it is uh from what I've seen here where I live you have you have martial arts schools where you can build um, um friendships um I mean, there's, there's concepts of some good training that goes on, uh, but really, and I can't really, I can't really speak and say that this is absolute, but from my understanding is talking with others who have been parts of these martial arts groups, everything stops in the class. So, I mean, all the communication, all the, all the interacting it happens in class and then you leave that class and you're doing your thing everybody else is kind of doing their thing no one really is concerned about what the other is doing um whereas in in our school like we build that bond with our students and that's and to be honest that's really what's so special about our school is um we want to to build that that relationship with our students um because we want to know who we're training we want to we want to know that at the end of the day um the person who came into class isn't going to be somebody who's going to misrepresent our school but it's not just that it's it's we want we want to build on your well-being and and our school is all about um personal development so so that's another thing with the ranking it uh it's a little bit more odd than than most places where about that yeah okay um you a lot of places you'll 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 train and then there'll be a date set and okay we're gonna test this this day for this rank and um everybody at this level will be ready to go for this rank. And then the test happens either pass or fail. Um, the only two belts that I have, the, the one belt, all of our schools in our organization test for is black because you, you become, uh, 
an assistant instructor. I, for my school, test at Blue Belt because you're a high rank, you become you, you become a leader almost for the lower levels. And I just I do the test because I want to make sure that everything you got everything from below that rank all squared up and you can teach it and and you're good to go there. Um, Other than that, our ranks are based off of the instructor's prerogative. So, so the instructor watches the student and goes, okay, you're developing good here and stuff. We might need some work here, but we're not constantly like saying, okay, you know, work on this. You're doing super good at this. Um, we kind of go day by day. And when we feel you've completed or you've gotten all that, the rank requirements, or you, you've completed your personal development, how we feel you should, then you'll get a rank at that point in time. So there is no, hey, get ready to test on this day or that day for most of the ranks. Most of them are just kind of the instructor uh, gives it to you when the instructor sees fit. Um, For me, I have actually, so now that I just said I have um, a lady in our school who just got her first level I also got another student who was a first level for two years who just got his instructor rank, second level. So now I got both of them to give me input and, you know, kind of tell me, hey, do you feel like this person's improving the way they should be? And again, th- this goes back to knowing the person. Like, uh, that. that's why things are a bit more personal in our school is because we want to know who we're giving ranks to and making sure that everything is, is justified in what we're doing. Let's talk about how you feel about that, that testing system. Of course, anybody listening, you know, might is probably looking at that and thinking, you know, that that's different. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not completely unheard of you know i've certainly known and even been part of schools that test in that way but tell us what you like about that what are the advantages for you as an instructor to having that more free form isn't the right word but that kind of openness with rank for your students um for me personally i feel it takes a lot of pressure away um, I know um, people can have some anxieties with predetermined testing and whatnot. Um, I think this this takes that away. Not only does it take that away, but it gives you that opportunity to to develop yourself. Like, um, like for me, uh. In our style, uh, when you become a black belt, we want you, uh, I mean, we have set requirements. So, I mean, it, it's not like, it's not like, okay, hey, do, do whatever you want, reset the whole curriculum and stuff like that. But we want you to have your own, um, your own piece of the pie, I guess to speak so so we want you to put your your um ties on things so like my school here is more of a tiger school because i have more of a tiger mentality Mm -hmm. whereas um my second level that i was talking about he so that my the way the way my mentality is it's more of a fire type mentality where my second level has a more water type mentality so if he ever started school himself he'd probably add more of of the crane acts aspects that 
that he does and he would he would have a different way of teaching than myself so no one black belt is going to look similar to the other black belt um and i know a lot of arts i know a lot of arts come off um uh doing that uh taekwondo for one i know they from from what i've seen and again um we're in the north dakota area but uh it seems like they want everybody to know one specific way of teaching and then and then that's that's how it needs to be done sure well that's not exclusive to taekwondo that's most martial arts and and, and we'll we'll take a small tangent now as we talk you know it, we'll, we'll get there we're going to talk about who who you're tied to because this is starting to mirror a bit of the conversation I had with that gentleman not too long ago. Most okay. traditional martial arts, the intention is here's what I was taught. I am keeping it pretty close to what I was taught and I'm mm -hmm. handing it to you very close. So you have it, in most schools, there may be some permission for individualization but it's still within the same framework and what you're talking about is an openness not only for what you choose to do yourself but the framework itself what you choose to teach your students is much more open and of course anyone who it, it listens regularly and especially listens in order knows that we're talking about sifu gary cecil who just a few weeks ago we had a great conversation about Wu Chi Kung Fu and the philosophies around it. And that's really what you're starting to talk about here, isn't it? Yes. Yep. And not, he is, yes, he is my other Sifu. Okay. How did you get connected with him? Um, so he, um, Dashi Gary, he, started the organization here um back in the 1990s i wasn't i wasn't quite here yet um at that time but uh he had a spot in in a small mall that we have over here and um two two of his black belts one um, that I talked about already, um, my one see who, uh, who passed Ryan Carden, he, uh, he was under, uh, Dashi Gary, um, as well as another black belt who is now Sifu as well. Um, like I said, my, my friends brought me in it and, and I mean, our name wasn't Wu Chi yet it was we were still under the the name fire and water at the time um and basically that's when uh sifu ryan Carden, uh when we had a a spot in the downstairs part of of uh of a company that we were renting uh a space from when they brought me there it was like about a week two weeks of me being in the school that i was pulled aside by sifu ryan and taught aikido and then that's basically when i i fell in love with it and then there were points where dashi gary would come and uh do seminars and stuff and i was introduced to him um when we were on on a place in Demers in Grand Forks here and he had a seminar and we he needed an uki and and I was volunteered as the uki I I didn't really know Dashi so well uh so um Dashi did this technique to me and you know 
I'm used to being taken down and stuff, but there was a point where I believe he got me into a wrist grab and then he did a, a punch to the stomach and he kicked out my leg. But the, the thing about this was he really did it. And I wasn't expecting the real hits to happen. Um, so after, after he did that to me, kind of went up to um, my, my other Sifu and I was like, hey, thank you for letting me know that was going to happen. Um, we got a kick out of it. Uh, it was all in fun. But um, that's, when I, that's when I found out, like, when Dashi does stuff, he does it more more real time real impact to show the effectiveness of it and and then we just started kind of talking and he was getting acquainted with me and in my background and we were still figuring out you know what style I was going to be as far as an animal style and I was flip-flopping between either a tiger stylist or a bear stylist and and bears, um, in the way we teach the bear style in our school, it's a bit more passive, so it doesn't really attack until you get close in on it. I meshed with it all right. Um, I could have been a bear stylist, but after my or after Dashi saw me uh, spar and then do techniques. He, he was telling uh, my other Sifu, yeah, he's a tiger stylist. We're, we're putting him on tiger. So, <clears throat> so that's how um, I came to be a tiger stylist because uh, of how he's seen my mannerisms and, and basically striking first when I sparred and, and doing my takedowns quick and fast and just getting them over with. Um, still showing the effectiveness of them. Uh, after my first level, basically he kept monitoring me um, throughout the years. And, and since then I've, I've gotten every rank that I have under him by him personally. And, and after first level, usually that's how it normally goes. I mean, now we're becoming a little bit bigger. So whoever is your head instructor um, at, at whatever point you're at can advance you so high up. So like, Right now, I'm a third level black belt. Um, I can I can advance somebody up to a second level black belt, a, a head instructor rank. Sure. Um, but I can't go any further than that. So, like, um, the, the what if like now uh, my 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 recent second level that that I was talking about, if he tends sometime down the line to be ready for a third level it would either have to come from dashi or i would have to be a fourth level to do that right i think we've got a pretty good idea of of you and who you are and what makes you tick now of course we've really only had one question so to speak that that we've chewed through and i always i always like doing that i like to get a sense as to who it is that we have on the line and it gives us some direction for, for where else we're going to go. It's the basics, so to speak. And, you know, let's, let's move now into a bit more of the, I don't know if I want to say the meat, but you know, some more, some more complex things that require us building on what we've already learned about you. Okay. And, and here's, here's a, a, I don't want to say a simple one, but one that I always enjoy. If you could train with anyone, from anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, you know, we've invented a time machine, let's pretend. Who would you want to train with? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I, in, in all honesty, it's, it's been a great honor training under um, my one Sifu, Sifu Ryan. And I mean, 
training under him to me is has been a blessing uh if, if there's someone else to train under i would say probably bruce lee i mean i grew up all my life watching a lot of his movies and and training and stuff so that would be that would be a privilege if if i was able to do that certainly the most commonly mentioned figure on our show despite being what are we 40 45 years since his passing something like that yeah absolutely absolutely amazing you know let's face it still the most famous martial artist what would you hope to learn from him or or what would you hope to train i i mean just his fighting philosophy always intrigued me um i mean if his conditioning as well for like the speed he had um was just crazy ridiculous uh so you know getting his you know toward the speed he had understanding um his his fighting philosophy from like his personal perspective i know that he does have a book out that uh that has a lot of the philosophies and stuff that he went over but just personally picking his brain Mm -hmm. and and a lot of his fighting would be awesome yeah are you a fan of his movies yes i am which one's your favorite i have to say enter the dragon you know it it's it seems to be everybody's favorite and the, there are some rare exceptions will someone will say you know game of death or something but in in each of those cases those folks seem to have watched that movie first whatever your first bruce lee movie is seems to be your favorite bruce lee movie and for right. me it was it was enter the dragon so that is my favorite one yeah i mean just so classic i mean so many years later right right and I, I don't know, I could be wrong on this. I, I've heard uh, stories that when him and Chuck Norris did the um, auditorium scene, that Bruce Lee was asking him to, to film it as an actual sparring session, not just like, not just you know go by move by move but not actually just yeah choreographing uh yeah so i certainly can't speak to it but that would seem consistent with so many of the things that we've learned even some of the newer things we've learned recently about bruce lee right i mean the, the man was a, a not not i don't want to say a perfectionist but so driven to creating the best thing he could in each circumstance and of course with someone like chuck norris on set you know it's going to be good why why limit it right how fun would that have been to have been on set and watch bruce lee and chuck norris spar just yeah i I would i would give many things to watch that right that would have been so great to see that happen what are you into anything outside of martial arts do you have any any hobbies anything that that I, I, um, the only thing that I have going other than martial arts, I mean, I, I used to, I used to wrestle as a kid and then like, um, me and my friends for like a past time, we would always get into watching professional wrestling, sitting down, just kind of seeing what matches were going i mean again that we we knew as we got older we knew that everything was choreographed and you okay you know they know who's gonna win who's gonna lose and stuff like that but it was very entertaining as kids for us to to be watching that and cheering our favorite wrestler on and stuff nice do you find much synergy between wrestling and martial arts? I mean, kind of, so <laughs> this is kind of funny in a way. Um, I, uh, 
as I was growing up, I watched wrestling and like, there's a lot of moves in wrestling that I was like, that's cool. But would that actually work? No, that wouldn't actually work if you're actually doing it. Um, so, so as I, as I grew and as I watched, I seen this character, Shawn Michaels. And I was like, okay, he's a really good wrestler. He's got very good conditioning. He's, he tells a really good story in the ring and stuff. And he did this. He got known for this kick. And it was like a side thrust kick, but he always did it to the face. And I always, because of the practicality of the move, I I was always intrigued by that maneuver. I got into martial arts. And funny thing about it is one of my favorite uh one of my favorite moves in martial arts is the sidekick between the sidekick and the spinning back kick. Um, both of those are, I, I really like both of those moves and sidekicks. I, I almost train religiously coming off the front leg um, in close or at a distance. So like, that's a big, uh, that's a big move for me to teach when I teach it. Okay, right on. It's no secret that life has stumbling blocks. Mm-hmm. My favorite question to ask our guests is for them to tell us about a time in life when things were challenging and how your martial arts, in whatever way that manifested, allowed you to overcome that challenge. Uh, I would say, um, yeah, one of, one of the biggest challenges for me, uh, was, oh, I got, I guess I got two that I can think of. So as I, as I came up in my, uh, training and stuff, um, I, I had a lot of tension in me and being able to relax was a it was it was difficult um but uh my sifu he he would he would tell me you know rod you know clear your mind don't think about so much at one time just just let stuff happen as it as it does and and I was, so I tried doing what he said, um, but it, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't clicking. I was like, how, how do I not think about what I'm supposed to be doing in, in the ring? And it, it was this process that I was fighting with over and over and over. And, and finally I got to like, I believe it was my red belt getting close to my black belt and it started clicking. You, you, you see the opening, take advantage of the opening. Don't sit there and pre think, Hey, I'm going to do this move beforehand and it's going to work out in, in the sparring match or whatever. So so as I um as I got more comfortable doing this and just letting letting things come as as they will, um then I started um flowing more with uh, like a lot of my striking. So um one thing I like to do uh is let's say if I if I throw a strike and it gets blocked to actually let that momentum just carry my arm around, do like something like a hooker or something that where there's the opening on the other side of the guard or what have you. So starting to kind of flow, flow my punches and, and kicks and stuff and, and let them kind of do their own thing as, as an attack is blocked or whatnot. Also, Using blocks as attacks is another thing that um, that I started incorporating into my 
into my school um because a lot of us forget that that just blocking something doesn't mean that it can't be used as an actual strike and breaking down a person's weapons as well and that's probably your best form of defense almost because if you can break down a person's weapons like the arms and the legs and and render them useless then you've basically won the fight at that point and technically you didn't have to really hurt anybody in the process of of that as well um nice the the other thing is teaching well uh, when i first got my my black belt uh I had like I got there's 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 such a difference between n- knowing knowing requirements, being able to do everything that's required of you, and then going off and actually teaching a school or teaching a group of students how to do these things um you know i i went through i went through a phase of where i've had people come into my class and i my class was either too exerting or there wasn't enough competition and i mean i know not there there's gonna no matter what there's gonna be a flaw that somebody sees and what they want in their training and and then you know there's always gonna be a school out there that has that for them um but but for me it's it was one of those things and again this is probably going back to being hard on myself uh I felt like I was failing. So um, this, this actually goes back to, to, um, to that relationship with a student. Um, once I started understanding how to, how to interact better with, with the students, and kind of kind of hear what they're saying without them like coming up to you and going hey can we can we like change things do this and that like just listening to to what they to what they're saying to you um in the moment of things and and taking that into account and and learning what what motivates that person um and keeps them enthralled with what you're doing and again that that's kind of got that's kind of got a double edged sword there because that person not everything they like or excel at or and get enthralled about is going to be the same as another person. And I've, I've gotten to the point where like, I kind of interchange where I try to involve as much from each person as possible. Like that's the thing about our classes too, is we have more of a mixture class where not everything is set that, that one day like we don't have a routine on a daily basis like each day when you come into our school there's going to be something different that you're doing um and and there besides the the attended requirements um the first like hour and a half of class is going to be something different and you're going to, it's going to keep you guessing. And I found that 
a lot of students like that because they get a taste of a little of this, little of that, and and it keeps it keeps them coming back and enthralled in what we're doing, and and that makes it fun for me knowing that 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 I I'm grabbing them, keeping them coming, and helping them improve because in the long run, and I've I've said this to all the black belts in in our school here is that in the end, like, you know, everything that I'm doing, I do it for the school. Like, even if for some odd reason we're in a bind um, and doors have got to close, I'm not just going to stop everything and leave the students going, okay, this is, this is where everything ends. Now you kind of take what you have and figure things out. I'm, I'll figure a way out to keep training those students and, and keep, keep them um, improving on, on their development and on the school's development as well. So, um, so yeah, I, I, even, even if, even if things do get hard, I strive to keep things going. And, um, I, I would never, ever shut the door on students and just end things, even if, even if it came that way business wise. And again, like, uh, Dashi Gary said, when we teach, um, any income that we get in our school goes right back to say the rent or of whatever building we're in or the equipment or anything the school needs. None of it goes to the instructors at all. Mm. I understand. You're certainly not the first person on the show to have that kind of dedication to your school, to your students and to really hold it in that, high regard that place in your life and it's something that i always appreciate something that i've really been honored to be part of at various times in my life with schools that i've participated in what are your goals if we look out over the next five or ten years what are you hoping to accomplish either as a martial artist yourself or for your school or maybe some other third category i haven't said um goal i mean it i mean one goal that would be nice is if i did have any black belt underneath me leave <clears throat> and go live somewhere else maybe uh having another school um developed uh in all honesty, I would really like to see the students we have now progress, get their get their black belts in our school. Um, and I mean, just basically be able to continue that process um, and make people better. I the the biggest thing for me um is is the outcome for the the students and and them and them achieving that the highest level they can they can become much um a lot of the students we have now i can see a lot of them being really good black belts um, if they, you know, stick to it. Uh, one gentleman in our school, uh, and, and this is what I mean about the family bond thing. Cause I, I know I keep going back to that, but, uh, he, I'm proud of everybody in, in who we have black belt student um but um this gentleman he <laughs> we had a tournament 
just recently that I mentioned. And, and when we started the competition, this gentleman, he was one of the first people to start cheering on each student that went through um, the obstacles, like the, if it was that or the sparring or the forms, um, he, he really supported everybody, um, in the group. And actually it's kind of funny because I, um, so Dashi, uh, Gary, when we're at these tournaments, if, if you do things to, to honor our school and, and, and Dashi sees your improvement, um, he'll sometimes just sporadically uh, do an advancement, kind of like what I say we, we do in our schools anyways, is just kind of, okay, now, you know, you're at this level. And he ended up getting his uh, green belt at the tournament. Um, that was more for his effort in the sparring and, and whatnot, but he also got an award later that night for, uh, they call it the Wuchi Spirit Award, which is basically um, doing what he was doing and like holding our school to that to that family like um, bond by cheering cheering the other students on from both both schools that were competing, um, having fun, going and helping people. Yeah, uh, it's uh it it was a great day for for our school and in general and whole um i i met a lot of really good people from um a fellow instructor school and i feel like um he as well is going to have a lot of really good black belts um, as a lot of his students come up because a lot of, a lot of the people have that, that, um, that focus and determination and, and um, that, that spirit in them. Um, and and I think um, as, as, our, our, as our Kung Fu Society grows and all, um, there's going to be, there's going to be things that the black belts that are in our, our college as of right now are going to start learning from um, these these students that are up and coming now, um, I can say right now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm learning some things and I think, you know, I'm learning some things from, uh, my second level student that I don't think I would have thought of before. Uh, and, and as a teacher, I, you know, I'll, I got some, some teachers, I think, uh, feel like, okay, you, you, you don't know everything I know, but you're, you're good enough. I, and I'm not that, not that you have to teach another student everything, you know, but I feel as if as an instructor, you the student that you're training should be as good if not better than you 
in the uh, at the point of of being like a black belt to speak um and that's that's kind of where my effort is and and i honestly feel like a lot of the black belts underneath me are at you know at that level where they're as good as i am and and you know i can challenge to say that some are getting even better um which i'm proud of and i and i think that should be like a a big goal for any any black belt training student mm, i hear you this has been good stuff and you know, this seems like a good time for us to start to wind down. So let's start with this. If folks want to reach you, if they want to know more about your school, you know, anything that you want to plug, tell us about that. We'll make sure that we drop it in the show notes. Whistlekick martial arts radio.com is the website. So go ahead with that. Okay. So yeah. If, um, if there is anybody that wants to come and and check our school out here in Grand Forks, North Dakota. We have a Facebook page. Um, it's under Wu Chi School of Self Defense. Um, that's been our main our main page. I mean, I don't have a a website or anything at this point, but a lot of videos and posts are on on that Facebook page that you can read and go over. Um, you get a week to see if you're interested in anything that we offer. And if in that week you decide that it's not for you, that's fine. And then you have the option of seeking out other martial arts. Um, other than, other than that, I mean, we do, we do kickboxing classes, Aikido classes, um, our adults classes are basically a mixed class that go for two hours. So that was the classes I was kind of talking about that were mixed with a bunch of different activities. Mm. Um, other than that, that's, okay. that's, yeah, yeah, that's all right. No, we'll, we'll make sure that we drop those over there. And of course, we always ask our guests to send us off into the mist with some, some great stuff. So what parting words would you offer up to the folks listening today? Um, <clears throat> if, if you have a passion for the martial arts, or if you're seeking out to do a martial arts, I would encourage um, to do so. And if you are in a martial arts and you are really enjoying the martial arts, I would encourage you to stick with it. Keep your determination and focus on it. Um, even if, you know, you want to incorporate other arts into that as well. Um, I know in my school, I welcome people to seek out different things as well. I, you know, if they want to learn jujitsu, um, finding a good jujitsu class, adding on to what you already know. Um, be proud of what you're doing um and uh and keep keep that passion for the school you're in um also seek out and maybe maybe bond with with some students um make make those friendships make that family um connection cuz um in all honesty uh it's good to have positive people around you and good to have people to talk to. And sometimes people don't, don't have that. Um, so, so to have that, you know, uh, that bond with, with other people is very helpful. 
Um, and I encourage to, to try to start it. I don't think there's any question that Lao Shi Hus is passionate, is dedicated, is really immersed in the martial arts as not only a practice, but a lifestyle. I suspect that if we were to find some crazy surgical, metaphysical way to separate martial arts from him, there wouldn't be a whole lot left. I really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you to all of you for listening. I appreciate your time. I appreciate, as I said in the intro, your support. It means more than you will ever truly understand. Head on over to whistlekick.com, see everything that we've got going on, products, projects, and other things that take that support that you show all of us and turn it back around and support the traditional martial arts. If you want to get a hold of us, find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. I am Jeremy at whistlekick.com if email is your preference. And that is all I have for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.